What's your take on the decrease, you know, in the number of uh, petrol being consumed in this figure? Well, I, I think uh, it's just natural for uh, one to to look at these issues and then uh, uh, on their merits. I, I, I think uh, what has happened is that a lot of people are cutting their coat according to their size. And um, so that has affected the quantum of uh, petrol that people are consuming. Uh, you know, because uh, this petroleum product has been subsidized for quite a whole lot of time. And uh, so a lot of people uh, could uh, put petrol on three, four cars and drive at the same time. Uh, for places where people could walk, they want to drive, and all of all these things were actually increasing consumption because uh, the petroleum products were not properly priced. And I think that's the challenge that uh, really, of course, this regime had to face uh, in removing the subsidy. And now people really uh, will do what is needed and not uh, leave the luxury uh, of uh, wasting uh, the petroleum products. And I think that uh, when purchasing power is uh, reduced, of course, the demand, what people are able to uh, buy will be reduced. Uh, you understand that uh, petrol is not only used for cars in Nigeria, people use it to power generators. And even for car owners, some of them now choose to go by public transport because uh, it's cheaper for them or it's seems cheaper for them to do that. So these are some of the reasons that have uh, contributed to the reduction in the consumption of um, petrol products in Nigeria. At 3.58%, it's quite um, significant. And um, yes, until people are able to uh, get more revenue, able to maybe have multiple streams of income and then the palliative measures that government is putting in place begin to uh, actually get to people like the 25,000 naira uh, to household we may not see an increase in the consumption of petrol because the purchasing power of uh, a lot of persons have been reduced uh, due to the removal of fuel subsidy it's like Nigerians are now being compelled to do what uh, I call uh, financial uh, management 101. You, know, you, you just have to. You just have to cut costs, like mm -hmm. what Idauza said. You know, you have to cut your clothes according to your materials, not according to your need now. No. Instances where you have four or three cars, you have to limit it to one to ensure that you manage the funds that you have. And, uh, you know, it's also teaching us how to prioritize, you know, when it comes to scale of preference, mm -hmm. you have to discover if going by public transport will save cost or driving will save cost. You have to make preference which one is convenient for you depending on your purchasing power. And also significantly is the fact that um, eight oil marketers were being issued an uh, import license. What that means is, you know, it, it liberalizes the process of import, unlike before where Unlike before, where you have uh, you know NMPC being the sole you know import offer, it was a, What's your take on the import license being issued to eight marketers? You know, to complement the effort being made by NMPC to import fuel. I think is that it is quite uh, uh, fundamental that uh, this particular regime has to break the uh, monopoly of uh, NMPC because NMPCL, where where of course you have monopoly. You find that, of course, there's a whole lot of abuse of the market process. And I think that's what has happened. I just wanted to lend a voice to what Blessing has said. Uh, I, we're not expecting to see further increase in uh, purchase of petrol, really. Uh, one should be actually looking at a decrease, more decrease, because uh, as, we are, as we speak right now, uh, the cost of energy globally is on the, on the rooftop, and uh, it is actually not uh, helping prosperity. And national development all across the globe. And I think it's only in Nigeria because we have not been able to provide our people with basic infrastructure. Uh, when you uh, subsidize almost everything in life, what you do, you give people fake life to live. And uh, we have lived that fake life uh, as a people for too long. And I think uh, it's uh, high time that we all come down from those high horses and begin to look, live lives that are real. Because these are some of the issues that actually are fueling corruption in our environment. Yet yeah, that said, it's, uh, it's, it's something that would be very fine that if we actually allow uh, the competitive forces of the market to determine the price of petrol, so that if two people are importing or six people are importing, of course, they will all struggle to sell in the market. And that, of course, will uh, bring down the price 
of the product. And we're also hopeful that eventually there will be also some contributions from local production uh, that will also reduce some of the logistic uh, costs that's associated with importation. All this in the long run will be able to actually drag down the price of petrol and more fundamentally also will help ease the challenge that we currently face with the forest exchange. All right, let's move on to Abuja, where the Corporate Affairs Commission has exposed 189 fraudulent companies in the federal cap capital territory that obtained land allocations through deceitful means. You know, uh, the issue here is you have about 189 fraudulent companies, you know, who obtained land allocation through deceitful means. Idauza, what's your quick reaction to this? How did this happen in the first place? Well, I, I think uh, uh, CTS is uh, constitutionally empowered to register companies, and they are supposed to be doing their due diligence before they establish companies and all of all these things. So it's within their power to actually determine who gets a license to run a corporation in Nigeria. But I'm always uh, skeptical to hear when uh, public corporations come out and uh, tell us that they have discovered fraud. Uh, they should do their due diligence, look at what happened, and then, of course, be able to clean up their system without uh, really dragging us in the mood. And I don't think that this news, they are all good for us. Uh, people just want our college or cheaper popularity. I don't think that's the route for us to go. If you discover that these issues are there, those ones that uh, have breached the laws of the land, take them to court and then prosecute them before you call them names. And I don't think calling names on the pages of newspaper is what we need to do uh, to continue to bastardize the image of our country. Uh, I keep saying to people, what we say uh, out with our mouth is what is actually uh, marrying the perception that people have about Nigeria. That everywhere you go across the globe, people are always worried and skeptical to deal with you because everything we talk about is fraud, as if there's nothing good that's happening in our environment. I think public uh, officers uh, should be able to manage their uh, communication. That even if these things are discovered, then take them to court, the appropriate court, to determine their liability in terms of uh, infringement on the laws of registration of company in Nigeria than going to prosecute people on the pages of newspaper or on the television screen. That uh, the discovery was prompted by a complaint from the Federal Capital Territory Administration. It also goes to show that they, on their own part, did not do due diligence or they did not do proper verification because if they had done that, they did not need to wait for a complaint from uh, the Federal Capital Administration to then begin to do some verification. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's rather coming late what they should have done at the early stage. They're doing now because the complaint has arisen. So it means that if there are no complaints, then you don't do what you should do. All right, the good news is that two suspects have been arrested and um, some of the personnel of the you know, ministries who, who is, is in charge has also been you know, uh, arrested because it takes two to tango and you know it, it takes connivance of someone in-house you know to be able to perpetrate this kind of uh, illegal accusation and that's exactly what has happened let's hope that this would deter them from continuing with this act all right let's move on to the national commission for refugees migrants and internet displaced persons has announced the successful repatriation of 108 stranded nigerians who were irregular migrants in Nigeria public, you know. Nigerians who are stranded in Nigeria. Nigerians are everywhere. He knows that. <laughs> but this one, they were in Niger, you know, illegally, and they are being repatriated to Nigeria. What does it suggest to you? They need to curb illegal migration. I think uh, uh, this is a... <laughs> This is ludicrous. It causes a whole lot of laughter because I can't imagine that we are talking about ECOWAS. Uh, well, I don't understand what it means by illegal immigrant, that we are supposed to have the liberty to move within the ECOWAS region for 90 days. Uh, these people have stayed 90 days. Uh, we have a lot of Nigerians who are in Nigeria, Chadians who live in Nigeria. Uh, I, I think uh, people should be able to really, uh, as Africans, we need to really tolerate one another. Because uh, we, we are actually brothers. Uh, you cannot differentiate between uh, somebody in Niger 
as somebody in Casina who would have migrated into these places to uh, uh, seek a good life. But I think it's also this game speaking to the fact that uh, sometimes we also need to count our costs uh, before we embark on some certain journeys, which of course uh, the Jackpot syndrome that people talk about on a daily basis, that many Nigerians just feel that the worst place to live on earth is Nigeria, but that is completely not true, uh, except that uh, you have not been to other places, you will not be able to see that there are also difficulties and people are having difficulty living. Uh, I keep emphasizing there is so much opportunity in Nigeria that we really don't need to go outside to stick before we can become good people. There's a whole lot of uh, gaps that needs to be filled. But unfortunately, many people just think that when you travel out of Nigeria and you go to even your neighboring country, lives will become easier and better. Uh, people must remember, we say this from time to time, there's no green grass anywhere. People always walk, water their garden and make the grass green. And I think we must learn that. Uh, there's a whole lot we need to do in terms of empowering our people. We spoke to some of those issues yesterday when we're looking at the uh, social security uh, uh, net for uh, the vulnerable people amongst us. How can government really begin to put people together and see how we can empower them uh, to bridge some of the gap in terms of food production? Uh, as we speak, uh, like I said, from time to time, we can't even export corn because we don't have enough of it to even feed our animals, not to talk about eating. Now, these are opportunities that are waiting to be exploited. And I think young Nigerians should understand this, that we can be in Nigeria and live a very decent life, a good life, and we don't need to really have to embark on journeys that will bring disrepute to us in uh, in distant future, uh, before we can think uh, we are doing things uh, useful to ourselves. So for me, it's good that they are back home and the government must find a way to resettle them and then give them a new lease of life and hope to, to live for tomorrow. I agree with you, Delsa. Some of the reasons, uh, sometimes it's about mindsets when people choose to live outside of Nigeria because look at it, Niger and Nigeria. Uh, <laughs> I don't actually see the reason why people or Nigerians would leave the shores of Nigeria and want to be stranded in Niger. It's not as if the economic opportunities there are better than what you would have here. And I also do not want to think this has anything to do with ECOWAS intervention in the crisis in Niger. And then uh, uh, talking about uh, illegally uh, or illegal migrants in Niger, having illegal migrants in Niger, uh, from Nigeria descends to Niger, we have a lot of Nigerians in Nigeria. But to go that route, I am very sure that the number of uh, Nigerians that will be repatriated back to Niger would exceed 108 stranded Nigerians that were repatriated. So uh, really, I do not really get where this is coming from. Uh, but anyways, for those who would want to leave the shores of Nigeria, it's better you do proper planning and you know that where you're going to, there are things you could be doing there that provide a source of livelihood for you and you not become stranded because it's actually laughable and it's rather an unnecessary embarrassment. The good news is the provision has been made for their welfare, but what bothers me, you have more children in the group, 44 yes. children, you know, 32 males and 29 females, but you know, the arrangement is being made for the allowances and to ensure that they live in good condition, which is highly commendable. All right, let's move on. The chairman of the Police Service Commission, Solomon Arasa, says 288,266 applications have been received since the opening of recruitment portal for the Police Commission. You know, this is talking about police recruitment, you know. Uh, there was a time we had a conversation on the need to increase the number of police personnel in Nigeria, Look, looking at the demand, you know, the police, you know, are in position to ensure that uh, they, they and do what we call internal security. And going by some of the security challenges Nigeria has been facing in recent time, you need to know, uh, the number of police yes, officers so we have in Nigeria, the ratio of police to citizens so that proper policing can be done. It also, what do you think about this development where you have more applicants who want to join the Police Service Commission? Yeah, uh, it's a good development. Uh, I remember the last time the 
PPRO Lagos State was saying that uh, police is not as bad as uh, citizens want to paint them, that a whole lot of Nigerians are uh, applying and there is police who is actually declining. It's not as if that uh, uh, profession is are not attractive as people uh, tend to believe. But I think it's uh, one good thing that uh, we need to actually increase the policing of our environment. Because there's no way we can be talking about development without security, without peace, uh, which has been disturbed in the last couple of years. As a country, we have uh, uh, suffered a lot in terms of um, attracting foreign direct investment because our environment is not uh, secure. But that said, I think, um, why the police is also looking at people uh, who are seeking uh, to be recruited into the force uh, in need of uh, intelligence needs to be carried on uh, to be sure that there are no infiltrations, that the enemy of the states are not finding way into the Nigerian police force. Because that's also very damaging when you find that uh, you have people who are within the force and they will be now sharing information that are supposed to be classified to people who are not state actors. And this has also, also impeded security in our client. And I think in terms of recruitment, we should have to do a lot of due diligence to see that the people who are applying to join the force are real people, uh, people who really have passion to serve in that uh, unit. So you just don't carry people into a place because they are looking for a job and they just want to do anything. And then, of course, they don't really have the interest of that job at heart. That's one bit. And then, of course, uh, the uptake in terms of the training for this personnel is also very important. Important because uh, one last um, report or documentary that was done on the training from one of the police colleges in Nigeria was quite uh, harrowing, where you see that uh, about 10 people are struggling for just one portion of meal. And that would not just be good because if you want really these people to protect us, to lay down their life, to defend the cause of the nation then, of course, we must dignify them, beginning from recruitment on the training until they are eventually deployed to man the post where they will be serving the nation. I also hope um, this recruitment will be done based on merit, uh, not just that uh, you have a specialist, or uh, some people have special interests, and I also want to believe that uh, the federal character principle will be you know, put into the implementation of the number of people who qualify to be police officer. But more importantly, merit for me is key because we must understand that whoever is going to be a police officer must have the capacity to do the job, the stamina, you know, the health-wise, you know, in terms of experience and the training, you know, must be ready for this task. And I hope people are not just seeing it as a way to earn a living, but also a service to, to the nation. Well, there are requirements and there are also trainings and examinations to be done. I do hope that uh, the process enables uh, the commission to have the best selection of uh, the new recruits. All right, let's get to Ogun State where the governor has announced the state's plan to recover expenses invested in agro cargo uh, uh, airport through concessional agreements with international aviation companies. Now, um, Ogun State is coming up with a new cargo airport, you know, it's in pipeline. Hopefully activities will kick off according to the governor by the end of the, before the end of the year. It's a way to also see what they can do to promote uh, businesses and investment. And this time around is in partnership with, you know, they are looking for partners who are going to come into the concessional agreement so that the state government can recoup their investment. Let me take this to Idaoza. What does this make of the need for PPP arrangement for projects, you know, a sensitive project like this, a cargo airport, you know, you know, Ogun State shares bother with Lagos State. What would be the impact of having a cargo, a cargo airport in a state? Yeah, I, I think successive regime in Ogun State has actually been investing in some of this basic infrastructure to see how to drive um, revenue for Ogun State. And, and I think for me, they're actually already using very positive uh, results. Uh, if you saw the ranking that was released on the IGI 
about two days ago, you discovered that Ogun is doing excellently well in terms of his aggressiveness in generating internally um, generated revenue. And I think that's a good news from Ogun State. Uh, the governor is doing so much to see how to mop up resource. Uh, because again, there is so much infrastructure gap in Ogun State and um, the need to uh, collaborate with the private sector operators and players to raise speed up development in that as this is also very critical. And uh, their proximity to Lagos really is uh, an advantage that all governments have to exploit and see how to actually uh, connect with Lagos and then the outflow of wealth from Lagos can enter into Ogun State. Uh, and I think uh, it's a welcome development having uh, that port and uh, that PPP arrangement. Uh, but I think uh, what is fa fundamental is, is that, of course, uh, those who are investing must be assured that uh, when they put in money, they can also take it out. And then, of course, there will be high yield and return on investment. We need to do all of all this. And I was uh, listening to the address of... Uh, the president two days ago uh, to the uh, National Economic Commission, all hands need to be on deck and how we can create mega cities around the states of the Federation and see that uh, development spreads. And then, of course, we can eventually eliminate poverty and then uh, let prosperity spread through the length and breadth of the nation. It's a good one for Ogun State. The, it seemed like a uh, lot of economic activity is ongoing there. And um, I like the drive. I like the focus. And um, to be thinking of a cargo airport, being that uh, they're not very far from Lagos as well, uh, it will help. It will decongest the, the, the traffic that you have in Lagos when you talk about cargo and even people wanting to clear off containers from Lagos. So it's, it's a good one. I hope they are able to actually bring it to uh, function so it, it will be a very good one for them. And I hope that other states take a cue from Ogun. It may not be in um, building a cargo airport, but in other areas, uh, see how they've talked, the IGR, who would have thought that Lagos would be beaten? Uh, because, uh, it, because Lagos is the commercial hub of Nigeria, you would expect that all they always be on top. But uh, it's good to see how creative they are with IGR. So a lot of states can't even sustain themselves if they were meant to or if they're asked to. So it, it's a cue from them and they should begin to learn how Ogun is able to um, create the environment for industrialization and think ahead, not just thinking that because your estate allocation will come and then you need not be creative about um, how you generate revenue. All right. You know, Ogun State seems to be a source of attraction for industries now. So we see most of the factories that you have in this area, you have more of them cited in Ogun State and to them, that's to improve uh, industrialization, production, and also improve the economy of that state. And interestingly, they're also making revenue from that. So we hope they keep up with that. All right, let, away from Nigeria now, let's get to Ghana, where the country, Ghana, is taking steps to boost its oil and gas production by selling more exploration rights to fund its energy transition and address economic crisis. We're in the age now where people are transiting from oil, you know, to other alternatives, energy transition. And Ghana has decided to you know, sell some of its all rights to be able to generate revenue and to be able to fund some of the activities that has to do with energy transition. Let me start with you, Idaoza. Your take is the move to boost oil production and also sell their all rights. Well, it's, uh, it's quite a huge uh, challenge for us, uh, the African continent, that um, we have not been able to really develop local technologies to actually drive the process of uh, growth, that we have to always look outside to be able to generate uh, support. Uh, Ghana economy has been experiencing a whole lot of decline in recent times. Uh, and yet, of course, uh, God has also blessed them with growth apart from gold and cocoa, that's also uh, very prevalent in that economy. And I just think that we must begin to grow our capacity, especially in research and development, so that as Africans, we can begin to find solution to our own problem. Because the truth is that he who dictates the, who pays the piper dictates the tool. Now, 
if you get into agreement with people and then of course you are entering into that agreement as a weaker partner, then of course you cannot really get the full benefit of the things that you want. Now, we, if we are exploring these uh, natural resources ourselves, we will make more, more revenue. And then of course we can determine what kind of technology that comes in here. But I'm also hoping, because part of the issues that we are here talking about in Casablanca is the way we do procurement. So that's such a way that we are not just allowing people to take away crude, but also allow them to bring and transfer technology to our environment so that even uh, some of this refining are done in Ghana, and then of course create uh, employment for the team in Ghana youths and then uh, make that uh, economy very robust. And I think all of all this must be factored into these issues. Yeah, why we still talk about transition, energy transition, and I think uh, uh, African countries must look at their own peculiarities this is what is happening in Europe. And I don't think that uh, the situation in Africa is as bad. And so we don't need to have to sell what we have to invest massively on a technology that is not local to us. Because the more of these things we actually do, it's also more money we ship to Europe and to Asia. So let's make use with what we have and grow up to a level that we can begin to invest in our technology and grow our own technology to solve our peculiar and unique problems. That's Morocco. Uh, the news about this country is that Morocco and the African Development Bank have signed three financing agreements worth over $282 million. Sorry. This agreement targets earth improvement, social program, and post earthquake relief. You know, there's an agreement between Morocco and the African Development Bank worth about $282 million. That's where you are. Is there anything you can add to it? Well, I, I think uh, a whole lot has happened in Morocco in uh, the last uh, few months, uh, aside the earthquake. Uh, the climate has also not been very good. Uh, a whole lot of locals are complaining uh, about the weather here and uh, the windy nature of the environment that is not favorable to agriculture and they are losing so much. And I think this is uh, where they are looking for the support from ADB to see how to intervene uh, and uh, resolve uh, these uh, uh, issues that nature has caused to them. Uh, I was speaking with a local here on Sunday and said to me, uh, the kind of weather that we are seeing in Morocco today, we have never seen it before. And it's uh, totally really affecting everybody and it's affecting our economy negatively. And I think this is the area where they are seeking the support from ADB. But it's also good that Morocco is uh, identifying with African Development Bank uh, because it's actually an African, but then of course they think more like uh, the European than they think uh, Africa. Uh, of course, you also know that uh, Nigeria is also thinking of building a pipeline to reach in Morocco so that we can also supply them gas, and that also can increase uh, the trade between Nigeria and Morocco. So all of all these are welcome development, and uh, we do hope that uh, uh, these uh, resources are channeled to the appropriate and adequate things that they are supposed to be used for. This morning uh, might not be used for the purpose in intended like any other project we go to, like any other project. Are you really worried in that light or you have confidence that this time around Morocco will get it right? Yeah, I think uh, a lot of people speak glowingly about the government in Morocco and I think they are quite, uh, uh, they are doing excellently well in terms of even building infrastructures and things that you see here. Uh, there's also an agreement uh, recently that of course we're also looking at that sign that they want to do undersea tunnel to connect Spain to Morocco in terms of uh, infrastructure. The government has really done so well. One of our, uh, our co participants here yesterday was saying, Well, I was so surprised. And, uh, he used the word that he was ashamed to see the extent to which Morocco has developed in terms of infrastructure. And we as a nation, we can't even see, uh, can't boast of things like this. Train are working. Uh, public buses are excellent. The streets of Morocco are clean, and the, the king of Morocco, people speak to him, and he's to be doing excellently well. 
What about the standard of living in Morocco? What we have to say about it and how are people coping with the economy in Morocco? Well, I think it's moderate. Uh, it's still fair. It's not as bad as uh, one would expect, but uh, uh, it's quite a place to be for me, uh, seeing that uh, they're doing so much within uh, themselves to, to grow a lot of things. And the standard is actually also European. Uh, it's, uh, it's quite different from most of the African countries where I've been. All right, thank you very much, Idarissa. We do hope that uh, you're enjoying your stay in Morocco. Uh, I just want to ask, because you talked about uh, how Moroccans think uh, more like Europeans than uh, Africans. What could be responsible for that? Is, is it about location or is it just a, a mindset? Well, I, I, I think uh, location is also critical to it because they are more proximate to Europe than they are to most African countries. And uh, the impact of uh, French in Morocco is also very uh, widespread and deep. And so they have imbibed a whole lot of French culture and this actually affects their thinking and their orientation. And their color also uh, is looking more like a European than they look like Africa. So uh, for me, I think uh, the allocation is uh, part and parcel of these things. But uh, more fundamentally, it's also the fact that uh, uh, they are properly also schooled and educated. And that interaction between Europe and Morocco is also very strong.